Okay, we are live now. Welcome everyone to another virtual conference of BS Group. I'm Elnara Senova, Communication and Event Manager at BS. I will be moderating today environmental module of the conference, Vessel Optimization Compliance, with the fantastic lineup of the speakers. Uh, Mr. Paul Woodall, Executive Director of Clean Shipping Alliance, Ms. Michaela Scanone, Marine Digital Solutions Manager of Lina, uh, Mr. Cesare Dapi, Deputy Technical Director of Tamigo Shipping Group, uh, Mr. Leonidas Margetis, Environmental Manager of Tsakos Columbia Ship Management. So, uh, without doubt, the collaboration between modernity and maritime will be a source of the advancement of the world economy. In order to comply with the regulations and requirements of the industry, the performance optimization is requisite. Environmental factors uh, and the demands of the globalized world have been a key factor in shaping the future of the maritime industry in terms of innovative, relevant and efficient services. Technical and operational measures can improve performance and the implementation of the modern technology to the vessels leads to the significant contribution and benefit for the sector members. In this online conference, we will discuss the yield of possible measures that could be performed in the maritime industry. Now, before we begin, a few housekeeping items to mention. We will run with the presentations and then go to the live Q&A session after all the presentations are completed with the aim to conclude at 4.30 p.m. Central European time. We are very excited to make the event as as uh, interactive as possible. So we encourage all of you to be very active. Uh, you are able to submit all your questions and comments through the Q&A button that you can find at the right part of your screen. Uh, we should have enough time for all your questions and we ask that you let us know if the question is directed to any particular person. And lastly, the presentation and uh, the recording of the event will be made available for the audience. And we, uh, for the, to the presentation or any other requests, you are kindly asked to connect, uh, to contact us uh, through info at bsgroup.uk email address. So, okay. We, I believe there is some technical problem with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Uh, Woodall. So let's get started with Ms. Uh, Michaela Sconone. And Ms. Michaela Sconone, uh, she's the Marine Digital Solutions Manager of RINA. Michaela obtained a master degree as a naval architect and marine engineer from the University of Genoa in uh, 2014. Michaela then joined RINA as a part of the Marine Digital uh, Innovation Team dealing with the data analysis CFD simulations, fleet performance management, and the development of other promising software solutions like electronic logbooks. Michaela also focused on new environmental regulations, being RENA's uh, scheme leader for the EU MRV regulation, as well as the person in charge for the new IMO uh, DCS regulation for the years uh, 2018 and 2019. She is currently Marine Digital Solution Manager following the development of added value digital services, uh, coordinating other naval architects as well as software development teams. So, Michaela, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, hello everybody, so today I'm gonna introduce the uh, new electronic logbooks. So nowadays the marine market has been facing major changes due to three main objectives that are actually permeating the plans and the decisions of all the actors. So we have resilience, for example, having the opportunity to continue the activities remotely, the optimization, so going paperless and having automated tasks, and the sustainability, of course. So, for example, environmental compliance. All these three pillars are part of the digital transformation. And in this uh, schema, the electronic record books 
are actually supporting a broader goal for more effective and sustainable ship operations. So going paperless has been pushed by IMO with the recognition of the, the electronic format of the paper logbooks. And actually it's uh, an important, considered an important achievement in order to be more environmental friendly, go paperless, and actually have benefits for the retention of the records by the companies, the crew and the officers. So the regulatory framework has been, the entry into force has been on 1st October of 2020 with MFPC 31474, where actually the amendments to MARPOL introduced the concept of uh, the electronic logbooks. For this reason, the new the administrations shall recognize the possibility to use electronic, electronic books in lieu of the hard copy ones. Of course, it's not only about the introduction of a new uh, way of reporting, but, guideline, but um, IMO has also given some guidelines to be followed in, also in order to develop uh, tools which are reliable and effective. So we have MFPC 31274 with the official guidelines on record books, which actually foresee also the check of how the system is installed on board and declaration to be carried on board those ships which are using the electronic logbooks instead of the paper ones. This declaration can be um, prepared by a flag administration or when delegated by an RO. Not all the flag administration are ready at the moment. We are not ready yet. Many of them were actually ahead on Marvel, so already recognizing electronic rock books uh, previous of the Marvel uh, official recognition. Uh, but any, anyway, anyhow, all of them are finalizing the processes of the approval. The tool that we actually have developed has been recognized at the moment by more than 20 flag administrations. Uh, we are in touch with all the flags and we are also doing some pilot cases in order to demonstrate the validity and the effecti effectiveness of the tool. So let's see the benefits that a tool like this could have, has on board and on shore. So the aim of the electronic logbooks that we've been thinking about is to help the crew reduce the mistake, mistakes, have trust on the tool, reduce their burden on board. So these electronic logbooks are actually tailored and configured on a ship basis in order to avoid wrong operations and wrong entries. The crew on board will only find what is actually feasible for their ship, what is actually allowed by company procedures. And this helps, of course, to reduce human errors. The entries are also validated and cross-checked in order to increase the um, reliability of the records and the awareness of the crew on correct operations. So we have some warning and error messages in order to let them understand that actually something is not correct and they're doing something wrong. The interface is as user-friendly as possible in order to make it the passage to uh, paperless reporting as smooth as possible and actually easy to implement the different logbooks on board and uh, uh, of course find it easier than paperless re than paper reporting. So this is a, an image uh, screenshot for the application login page, so the first page that the user finds in front of him. As you can see, we have different colors with uh, um, different meanings, and this helped the user to find in a glimpse what he still has to do, so to reduce the, um, the time lost filling in the information. We also have some user alerts on the right in order to recall the, the user to what he still, is still pending from his side. As I said, of course, we have implemented the controls. For example, this is an incinerator, a record book part one incineration operation. 
and we have an error displayed on the page because the operator has inserted some values that were not coherent with the incinerator rate, for example. So the user is actually stopped because the operation is not feasible based on the ship details. Of course, an important part of the work for the crew on board is not only recording the operations, but also signing them. So in order to make it easier for them to understand and to recall the, the actual logbooks, what they are used to, we have the preview of the printout uh, shown while the user sign it. And of course, at the end, the final result is the our record book, for example, in this case, so the record book printout as it is used to be. Uh, this is, of course, one important thing which on which the flags are focusing on. The standard template is reproduced, and again, the users, the crew on board, is familiar with this, with this uh, view, and it's easy for them to to check it and to produce the printout in a PDF format. So what we're trying to do is to have a virtuous cycle on board, having the crew displaying and seeing only the possible operations, only the real connections between the tanks are actually configured, uh, giving to them some calculation tools. So for example, we implemented the sounding tables in South the Two, uh, having some automatic consistency checks, again, to check the quantity transferred between the tanks, to check if what has been reported is correct. This creates trust in the tool by the, by the crew, trust in the calculations, having the automatic notifications gives them the opportunity to be sure they're not forgetting anything. And this at the end reduces, of course, the paperwork as we have, for example, for many operations, a single point of entry, if they have to record it in many logbooks, for example, reduce of burden and at the end, more time for operations that are considered vital for the ship, much more than the reporting. From a shore point of view, of course, it is very important to ensure the accountability of the record. So from a regulatory point of view, from shore point of view as well. So we have three different layers. We have the user authentication, user authorization and user signature. So with the user authentication, we actually ensure that who enters the tool has a specific username and password and is actually allowed by the master on board to operate. So we um, avoid unwanted connections. And at the end, it's again the responsibility of the master to control who's operating in the logbook. On the user authorization side, we have an easy control of what a user can do inside the tool. So we can decide that a user can sign certain logbooks and other logbooks, uh, and he cannot work on other logbooks. He can, for example, work on the sounding, daily soundings, but not record operations and so on. And again, it's also easy to configure some accesses in read-only mode in order, in order to give it to, for say, controls or to, find, to flag administrations in case of need. And at the last step, of course, we have the user signature. So the operations have a legal validity. So we have to be sure that who is signing the operations is actually the person who is meant to. So we have a personal PIN code, which is changed every time the user is embarked. And we have uh, the possibility to add the biometric recognition through the fingerprint reader. So this is an example of the fingerprint reader that we are actually using. And of course, as we are working on board a ship, uh, probably in an engine room, for example, with the uh, record book part one, we've foreseen the possibility to have a failure of, the, of this equipment because, for example, the fingers may be dirty, there may be something uh, not uh, properly done. So the crew can override the biometric uh, identification using the PIN code, but as they are uh, over, overcoming an, an operation which is mandatory for this ship, they have to add a justification and the system keeps track of why the user has not used the fingerprint reader. So we actually have a, a stream 
of operation on shore side. So this system is cloud-based and we ensure the reporting continuity on board and the server failure with the high availability installation and offline capabilities, of course, in order to have the ship self-consistent and avoid the stopping reporting. But on the other end, we stream continuously the information um, to shore side in order to give to the companies the overview of the fleet on how the fleet is performing and to have valuable insights. So as said, this is a cloud-based solution. We have uh, we are using Microsoft Azure at the at the moment, and we have the real-time stream to shore. Uh, of course, it's important again as this um, this information has legal value to avoid uh, tampering. So we have a tamper-proof code, which is mandatory for IMO. And in addition to that, we can add uh, uh, an additional layer connecting the records to a public blockchain. And at the moment, we're using Ethereum. So from sure side, as I said, it's not possible only to, to check the records, so what is being recorded on board, but also to have some statistics on the reported data. So what I'm showing now, for example, is a, a diagram showing the uh, details on the sludge. So we have a generation, incineration, what was discharged ashore, what was evaporated, and so on. And we can also have some valuable insights comparing different uh, quantities. For example, here we are seeing the seeming time compared to the build generated. And in this uh, diagram, you are seeing the fuel bunkered compared to the sludge production, so the generated sludge. So, also from shore side, we have the opportunity to create a virtuous cycle. So, the, having the information, collecting the information on the shore and making insights based on them gives the opportunity to increase the awareness of the um, of the owner of the company about the production on board, about the pollutants that are actually produced on board, and checking the operations reported, having the opportunity to see the records from shore gives also the opportunity to target the crew training based on more frequent problems, more frequent errors, and so on together with the reduction and the opportunity to give a 24-hour support is needed from, uh, from shore side to the ship. So, for example, allowing particular operations in specific moments that are usually not feasible. So, this a kind of application, again, reduces the burden also from shore side because being aware of what happens uh, allows to promptly uh, intervent if needed, and at the end reduces unwanted fees and pollution. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope I've given you an idea of how the love books are in our mind. Thank you. Michaela? Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. Uh, we still got some questions and we will ask, answer all of them in the Q&A mm -hmm. part. The interest was quite high actually to your presentation. So I uh, would like to, let's continue the, our presentation with Mr. Cesare mm -hmm. Dapi, uh, te te Deputy Technical Director of the Amigo Shipping Group. Prior to that, Mr. Davi spent 12 years as a technical manager responsible for the tanker fleet division. From 2000 to 2002, he was senior consultant at ICM Consulting, where he led several ship management optimization projects, along with 19 years of experience in shipping management, ship management, maintenance optimization, cost optimization, disaster recovery projects, repeat projects and innovation. Cesare Dapi holds a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Naples, and he's a member of Intertanko Technical Committee. Mr. Dapi, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning to everybody. First of all, are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay. 
So one, uh, one month ago, uh, when I was invited to do a speech uh, in a uh, present seminar, I realized that there, are, uh, there is an important topic uh, for which, despite the regulatory framework is on the table uh, of the ship owners uh, for many years, and despite uh, there are several publications and guidelines by the classification societies for the selection and retrofit of water ballast treatment system, it is still missing today a proper sharing of the information related to the service experience. Uh, I do believe that today a sharing of information is one of the key elements to push at uh, boundaries of knowledge. And having in mind such need, I prepared the next page with aim to share uh, with you uh, a path followed by, by the Mika company in the proper management of water ballast treatment system. Uh, we cannot design any, any path uh, without understanding the contents. And today uh, we have two approaches or, or positions. Uh, the United States is in a phase of compliance mode uh, against the rest of the world, which is in the experience building uh, phase. But what does it mean, uh, this kind of, uh, of approach and differences between uh, the United States against the, uh, the rest of the world. It means a very limited possibilities to discharge ballast water not in compliance with the United States federal code against a more flexible approach in the rest of the world. Such approach has several implications in terms of reporting requirement, sampling requirement, contingency measures, and uh, investigation. I would like to highlight uh, four important differences. The first one uh, is the reporting requirement. Uh, in case of failure in the United States, uh, uh, such event does require to notify it immediately uh, at the nearest capital port zone and then to the capital port zone of the port call, while in the rest of the world, uh, we need just to notify the issue to the local port authority. This is on top of the notification to the, the flag and administration and classification society. Uh, the second difference between the United States and the rest of the world is related to the sampling. There is a provision for sampling requirement according to the VGP in the United States, uh, of which the periodicity depends by the type of the plant against the rest of the world where no requirements are, are there. Uh, the third difference is, is related to the contingency measures. Uh, for the contingency measures, taking apart what is impractical, uh, like no ballast water discharge, use of potable water, discharge of at shore facility, what we are experimented often in case of failure of plant during the commercial operation import, is to go out of 12 nautical miles under the direction of the capital port zone, doing a ballast water exchange, or in case of failure during the sailing time to perform a ballast water exchange before the 200 nautical miles from the United States baseline. Uh, please keep in mind that the instruction that you are receiving could be different from district to another district in the United States. In the rest of the world, instead, the local port authority in several cases allowed to use D1 standard in case of failure of the, of the plant. The last but not the least is the behavior of the United States Coast Guard against the rest of the world, which in several cases is like a prosecutor analyzed to confirm the unexpected uh, availability of the plant, uh, which must be supported by the communication with the maker to solve the issue, and must be documented by the maintenance record of the plant. You can understand easily that in such scenario, the key element to succeed in the proper management of the water ballast treatment system is the knowledge of the plant in terms of understanding the limitations, understanding the operation mode, 
understanding the systems, understanding the, the failure mode of the of the stolen plants. Let's let me start from the first point. In the in the in the present slide, I have reported uh, the main limitation for four kinds of plant which we have fitted in our in our fleet. For all of them, we have two important limitations for the effectiveness of the treatment in US water, according to the United States Coast Guard type approval certificate. The first one is the holding time, and the second one is the salinity. Both must be considered in the voyage plan, and as best practice, both limitations should be highlighted in the charter, in the charter party whenever the vessel is trading in the United States. To keep in mind that such limitations are only applicable in the United States water, while in the rest of the world, we must take in consideration only the limitation highlighted in the type approval certificate issued by the flag administration. In addition, systems fitted with only one back flushing line are subject to the letter of protest uh, if the vessel is berthed on the side where the back flushing line is fitted. Such limitation is mainly related to the vessel fitted with the UV type system, which does require to treat the ballast water two times, ballast and the ballast. To solve the issue, we are either fit the second back flushing line or to reposition in the back flushing line down the water line at the first scheduled dry dock out of the water. The second important aspect is the understanding of the operation mode. Uh, the understanding of operation mode is a key element for the proper management of the plant. And particularly, the UV type does require a warming up of the UV reactor before the treatment, and such phase is there either during the ballasting or the ballasting. As a consequence, if the warming up is done in muddy water, the sequence of the ballast treatment will not take place. So means that uh, the ballast water will be not treated according to the, the requirement. Talking about the understanding of the system and the failure modes of the plant, uh, basically we have two key elements in the whole plant. One is the filter and the second one is the reactor. Uh, we are experimenting uh, following failure mode reported in the, in the present slide. Filter damaged by uh, back pressure, uh, back flashing motor shaft and scanner tips damaged by overload, UV sleeves damaged by foreign objects or wrong tightening, or a combined failure mode. Often we have uh, such kind of combined failure mode, which can start from the wrong timing of the filter inlet and outlet valves, which can lead to the back pressure in the filter, so the filter got damaged, can lead such even to the overload of back flashing motor, and such even can lead to the back flashing motor shaft broken. On the other hand, the filter damaged can lead to the foreign object in the UV reactor and consequently, the UV sleeve uh, damage. So the final consequence is the plant out of uh, order. Some other failure are related to the UV lamps damaged by mm, overheating or not proper sealing, or entering of salt water in the wiper motor shaft due to the leaks of mechanical mechanical seals. As you can understand. The knowledge of the water ballast treatment system and the relevant the relative failure modes is of paramount importance in defining the list of critical items to be kept on board, on top of what's suggested by the makers, as well as the full operational status of the sensor protects the plant from failure, allowing to work it within the admissible limits suggested by the maker. As proactive measures, we have implemented the, the enrollment of the water ballast treatment system under the critical equipment, 
a specific maintenance plan, a specific list of critical spare parts in order to mitigate uh, uh, the failure of the plant, and the plant performance test according to the VGP requirement, irrespective of the vessel trade. So it means in the worldwide trade of the, of the vessel. Among the full set of best management practice uh, highlighted in the present slide, uh, the most important that we have uh, adopted are related, uh, first of all, to the approval of ballast water management plant for both standard D1 and D2, to uh, have highlighted the ballast water international certificate, both standard D1 and D2, to consider the plant limitation in the voyage plan and in the starter party of the vessel, and a worldwide frame agreement for the water ballast treatment system sampling. Finally, also to have defined a clear reporting requirement and communication flow in the case of most on comp of non-compliance. In the next slide, uh, I have uh, summarized uh, uh, the five common cases of non-compliance uh, and the relevant uh, the communication flow to be adopted. The first one is related to the non-compliant ballast water due to DT method not available, means both plant out of order. Non-compliant ballast water due to DT method partially not available, only one plant out of order. Non-compliant ballast water due to muddy water. Non-compliant ballast water due to the system working out of the sign range. And plant not approved for freshwater mode, specifically for vessel operating in the, in the, in the river. Uh, I have reported the, the most common case of non-compliance uh, with different flag in different port. And uh, I would like just to highlight two, two cases highlighted in, in red. Uh, we had some vessel having traded in the United States. Uh, the plant at the beginning was not approved for the fresh water. The vessel was in port for, to do a backloading. Um, and the vessel was stopped to do the operation. And it was directed by the Capitan Port Zone to go out 12 nautical miles to do a ballast water exchange and to take ballast using the ballast water treatment system before proceed with the backloading uh, operation. Then we have uh, uh, we had another case uh, with both plants uh, not operative for technical reason. The vessel was in port during the, the ballasting operation. The port was Houston. And again, the vessel was stopped uh, by the Capitan Port Zone and directed out of 12 nautical miles to do the ballast water, water exchange. Um, here there is another, uh, there are another two cases uh, very interesting while the vessel uh, in dry dock. Uh, the first case is related to the ballast water supplied before the departure from the dry dock. And the second case is uh, uh, related to the last parcel uh, while the vessel is approaching the dry dock, uh, which must be discharged by gravity and so cannot be treated by the water ballast treatment uh, system. And in red, uh, we have highlighted uh, the, the best practice adopted uh, 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 along with the green light of flag administration and local, local port authority. Um, As a last point, uh, uh, I would like to uh, highlight uh, 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 another important aspect, which is the uh, overlapping between the different conventions. Uh, Ballast Water Management Convention, uh, Federal Code, the United States Federal Code, and the uh, MARPOL Annex 1. Like, for instance, uh, how to deal with fresh water coming from the integrated bilge treatment system in NG room and collected in after peak tank, how to deal with gray water collected in the after peak tank and how to deal with the heavy ballast in the cargo tank. All of such aspects were treated with a specific round table with the, with the Coast Guard 
and uh, I have uh, provided uh, the minutes of the of the round table to the organizer to share with all of you. Uh, in conclusion, to sum up, be aware uh, about the differences in approaching the ballast issue and the relevant requirement be behind the United States against the rest of the world. Be aware about the plan limitations, operation mode and, and failure mode. Enroll the water ballast treatment system under critical equipment, implementing a specific maintenance plan, critical spare part and sampling program. Develop a clear communication flow for the most common case of non-compliance and train the people. Be aware in how to deal with the convention overlapping. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Tapia, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, let's answer some of the questions that are addressed to Mr. Dapi and to Michaela, and then we can continue. Uh, hopefully, during that time, Leonidas will be able to join us. All right. So, here have, we have some questions. And... Mr. Dapi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, because one of the recent questions was directed to you, actually. So if you don't mind, I would like to start with you. And the question is from uh, Mr. Adam uh, Jolliffe, and he asks, does D'Amico, give me a second. Okay, I just, all right. Does the Amigo shipping have any compliance monitoring devices on board the vessels to periodically check for D2 compliance as a part of its maintenance procedures? Hi, is can you hear now? Mr. Dapi, can you hear us? Yes, is the question related to the monitoring of water ballast treatment system or generally speaking a system for the performance monitoring of the vessel? I believe, uh, let's say the other detail wasn't mentioned, let's say in the question. So let me repeat the question once again, so maybe it would be much, much clearer for you. Does the Amigo shipping have any compliance monitoring devices on board uh, the vessels to period periodically check for D2 compliance as part of its maintenance procedures? Okay, talking about uh, the maintenance procedure uh, of the plant fitted on board, uh, we uh, have uh, implemented uh, from many uh, years uh, um, uh, a different uh, uh, approach in maintenance uh, uh, strategy uh, against uh, the traditional approach of time-based uh, overall. Okay? Uh, in our vessel, uh, we have fit the system which allowed to uh, transfer ashore maintenance data uh, like the condition maintenance-based strategy, uh, which uses the latest technology for the uh, vibration monitoring latest technologies uh, in order to do uh, 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 a video inspection, endoscopy inspection for the uh, machinery, uh, thermal imaging for the machinery, all data are transferred ashore, and based on the outcome of the inspection, we are able to see if the, the maintenance uh, jobs performed on board according to the approved maintenance plan are effective or, uh, or in case we need to to uh, uh, reduce or make more shortened the time between overall according to the uh, data uh, analysis. So the, the, the answer is yes, we have implemented a system which allowed to, uh, 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 to do a proactive maintenance approach. All right. Thank you very much for this answer. And Leonidas is back to us. Leonidas, can you hear us? Hello, hi, can you hear me now? Okay, yes. 
That's great. Thank you. Uh, so the floor is Mr. Leonidas Margetis. He's environmental engineer of Tsakos Columbia Ship Management. Leonidas has been working for Tsakos Columbia Ship Management since um, 2013 as a marine environmental engineer responsible for the company's environmental management system and the fleet's uh, environmental compliance. He's an environmental engineer and marine biologist with two masters of science in sustainability and maritime technology and a Marais member in the standing member of Intertanko's environmental com committee. Leonidas, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know if you can see my screen. Let's try. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. We just ask you okay. to put to put it in full page mode. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, and uh, to my today's presentation uh, is going uh, is about the biofouling compliance and uh, biofouling compliance from a ship owner uh, perspective. Um, so. Uh, in order to move on, we need to understand uh, why biofouling management is important in vessel optimization. Um, biofouling management is an important issue for the ship owners uh, because it has the potential to transfer invasive aquatic species and decrease the ship drag uh, in water. Uh, an increased drag uh, significantly reduces the hydrodynamic performance of the vessel and it can also may result in hull corrosion, blockage of internal piping, uh, and other factors that can degrade the integrity of the, of the, of the vessel and, uh, and the vessel structure and impending the safety of uh, the operation. And of course, increases the fuel consumption and the uh, associated uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Several regulatory initiatives have been issued, uh, which aims to act as a tool uh, in order to minimize the associated uh, environmental impact. Um, first of all, we do have the 2011 IMO guidelines. Uh, the 2011 IMO guidelines provide a framework uh, for adopting a biofouling management practices and procedures. Uh, it records a series of best management practices and also it, uh, it, it requires uh, record-keeping uh, procedures. This is uh, currently under review by the IMO and the IMO-related bodies, and uh, this is expected to be discussed, its next revision, at the next PPR uh, next month. We also have uh, several national biofouling regulations. Uh, one of these is the 2012, the US Coast Guard regulation, this is more or less, uh, it is aligned with the IMO guidelines. However, we should note that the US uh, VGP uh, is currently under revision and we do have a new framework, the US VIDA. And uh, in the US VIDA, it is expected to have a dedicated and extensive section for uh, biofouling management. And the forthcoming uh, US Coast Guard implemented acts uh, are uh, distributed with particular interest uh, in this area. Other uh, national regulation is the Australian Biofiling Regulations. Uh, this is since 2009. Uh, Australia is more or less, again, uh, aligned with the IMO guidelines, but uh, is currently also developing uh, uh, new guidelines, new national uh, guidelines, which are expected to enter into force uh, either this year or the next one. The particular interest about Australia is to assess whether this is going to be aligned with the New Zealand's uh, strict uh, regulatory framework, which are going to be in a moment or two. Then we have uh, regulatory national uh, regulations with more extensive requirements. One of these is the biofouling regulation, the 2017 of the California state. California State provides a strict uh, procedural, cleaning, record-keeping, and reporting framework. 
one of the uh, procedural aspects of the requirement by California state is the requirement to have a detailed ballast water management plan, which should incorporate several aspects, including and uh, particularly focus on the paint lifespan of the uh, defouling coating, the detailed record keeping uh, of the biofouling record book in line with the IMO guidelines, and uh, detailed, uh, detailed arrangements of the docking blocks position, as well as management practice associated with the untreated areas uh, under the docking uh, blocks arrangements. In addition, California has a reporting requirement. Uh, California requires to report on an annual basis uh, several uh, uh, biofouling information. Uh, recently, California has also uh, issued an online platform for reporting this. This is, although that is uh, a good practice, uh, it should be noted that it has added an additional administrative burden uh, for uh, the ship owners. Failure to comply with all these requirements may lead to a violation of warning letters, letters or grace periods, and uh, in case of a repeatance, then additional uh, measures uh, might be applied. California also has uh, requires a biofouling assessment for the ship owners prior to arrival uh, to a California port, and this is associated uh, with uh, vessels with extensive idle period uh, with 45 day uh, days or more, or more consecutive days. Then we have the New Zealand biofouling regulation. New Zealand introduced uh, uh, regulations back in 2018. It's one of the few biofouling regulations which has a specific uh, clean hull transport. And um, this also requires a very careful biofouling assessment for all ship owners prior to arrival to a New Zealand uh, port uh, in order to assess its compliance with the clean hull transport. Uh, towards this end, uh, we have implemented various tools. One of these tools that we uh, we use is the biofouling risk report. Uh, with the biofouling risk report, we assess vessel conditions uh, prior to arrival uh, in order to define the biofouling risk. And we use various factors to assess this and benchmark this, such as uh, the vessel a vessel's operating profile, salinity concentrations, chlorophyll levels speed distribution, uh, the vessel's trading area, and the current biofouling condition of a respective vessel. Again, failure to comply with the subject regulation might lead to denial into entry in a New Zealand port, which also might have a significant uh, commercial uh, impact. What are the key aspects of successful biofouling management? Uh, biofouling management is, is, is an element and combination of performance monitoring, quality assessment, and procedural control. Biofouling management is an integral part of the SCMP, the SIP Energy Management uh, Plan, uh, measures, and particularly the management practices and policies associated with the hull and propeller maintenance. Multiple cleaning events might, hope that, might have, not have the desired results, and therefore, uh, careful treatment is necessary in order to avoid uh, any damage to a defouling uh, coating. Biofouling condition is also uh, associ is directly associated with an effective defouling, a defouling coating strategy. Uh, an effective solution of a defouling coating may lead, uh, may lead uh, to a delay of the first underwater hull maintenance event. Uh, within the five-year cycle of a vessel from a dry dock to a dry dock. The target here should be to minimize the biofouling rating to the minimum possible without affecting the defouling coating condition. In this respect, the desired biofouling rating target should be to be kept in the levels of grooming or the slime layer. In-water cleanings requires uh, strict qualitative criteria. Uh, this include, but not limited to several uh, aspects for the diving companies, such as uh, quality certifications, uh, history of the operations, uh, safety and health cleaning procedures, environmental procedures, 
equipment description and specification, any vacuum control technologies, any potential uh, paint manufacturer certification, uh, also any related ISO 9001 criteria, and of course, experience of the diving personnel that is going to carry out the diving operation. Several guidance these documents have been issued uh, regarding uh, defouling management and also in water cleaning. In the, car, in the TANCO, BIMCO and uh, ISO has also uh, circulated various guidelines and also other institutes we have seen several uh, guidances. Um, however, all this needs to be harmonized and we need to take into account a holistic view uh, and therefore, all these guidances should be brought into attention of the next revision of the biofouling guidelines uh, with a view of a potential uh, biofouling uh, convention in the future. Bear in mind uh, here that the biofouling, uh, when we speak about biofouling, we speak about transfer of invasive species, which is directly associated also with the ballast water convention. New practice and technology should be considered. Currently, there are two trends on this. There is the autonomous hull cleaning devices, which aims to keep the fouling ratings on the grooming levels. And there is also the in-water capture, which aims to minimize and uh, limit uh, the, the transferring of invasive species in the local marine ecosystems. Lastly, biofouling management is also a vital aspect towards reducing uh, the, the greenhouse gas emission targets and the industry's decarbonization strategy. Biofouling management, uh, if, we if we could carry out a detailed fuel risk assessment, I approach it is understood that the biofouling management will remain one of the most important operational uh, measures for the reduction of the carbon intensity indicators targets in the forthcoming future. Uh, therefore, uh, it's, it's important it will remain uh, on the high agenda in order to maintain compliance uh, for the vessels. Biofouling management also contributes towards compliance with the UN Sustainability 13 and 14, the climate action, the life below sea. And this is also important for the companies in uh, respect to, to their uh, environmental social governance or sustainability reports. And also uh, biodiversity, marine pollution and emissions management is becoming more and more uh, an important aspect for various stakeholders, uh, uh, such as uh, financial institutions, through the commitment for targets that are, associated, that are considered prerequisites for green financing or uh, by charter requirements to the reporting of the of, the, of data of emission data uh, for their estimation of scope two and three uh, emissions. And this concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I'm happy to answer any related questions uh, later on at the Q and A. Thank you very much. Leonidas, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, Mr. Woodall, can you hear us? Mm. Let us answer some, the, some questions that already came, and hopefully during that time it will be possible, you know, to fix that problem. Okay. So, uh, everyone can hear me, right? Ms. Michaela, Leonidas, Mr. Tapi. Okay, great. So let's get started to answering some of the questions that we already got. Okay. And the first question is directed to Michaela. And it says, uh, can the data be added or ch changed in the electronic logbook at a later date? Okay, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Okay, okay. So uh, the information can be answered only from the uh, onboard side, of course, all the operations, all the records. And the only opportunity to insert uh, the operation in a later date, so for example, if we have recorded an operation today and we want to figure out that we forgot an operation, we want to insert another one two days ago, 
The only way to insert is to use the dedicated code as per Marple. So for example, the I code for the record book part one. Um, why for changing the operation, it is the, the data, it is not possible. We foresee the deletion of the operation and then a new insert. So actually everything is uh, tracked on the software. So we know who has performed what anytime. And of course, as this is, has legal value, of the of the information which is reported we are very precise on this matter okay thank you very much for the answer and we have a question addressed to leonidas and it says dear leonidas do you think we are going to see more restrictions and legislation for biofueling rules and regulations what do you think Yes, of course, uh, I believe so. We have seen currently many restrictions regarding the diving operations worldwide. Uh, more and more local regulations and foreign restrictions associated with the cleaning operations. Uh, therefore, the aim should be to, to delay cleaning operations by, by applying effective coating, uh, defaulting coatings. And the second should be to apply uh, measures uh, on the grooming level uh, in order to also uh, handle any potential restrictions uh, by any local regulations. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, it is in our view that uh, uh, global and harmonized regulations are necessary for the biofouling. We consider it as a, as a hot topic uh, for the next few years especially because it's an area which is uh, directly related with the associated uh, emis emission gas emissions. All right, thank you very much. And here we have another question. I'll just ask you a second. Are the validations also tailor-made? I believe it's directed to Michaela. I think so, yes, thanks. Uh, yes, the validations can be tailor-made, so we have a big configuration part in the tool where we can act, act on the single tanks, uh, configuring the single equipments. So it's, yes, tailor-made on a ship basis and based on company procedures. All right, thank you very much. And here we have another question. And... I just ask you a second. All right. Hmm. What was the main motivation to create this platform and will it be available globally flying? Again, Michaela? Uh, is it to me again? Okay. Yes. So as we now, we are actually working in uh, the digitalization on a 360 point of view. So having the opportunity to reduce the burden on board, for example, with the logbooks, uh, connected with other information gained, for example, from IoT. Uh, so we have also other softwares for performance monitoring. And putting all this information together gives us the possibility to really help the, the customers, the owners, to have uh, advantage from their data, from what they're collecting. Because of course, we've noticed that there are many systems on board, but we're not talking together usually. So putting all the uh, systems together, talking in one platform, will give the opportunity to enhance the added value from what we are actually collecting. Okay, great. And there is, there's a question. There is a major share of the global ballast water treatment market in Asia. Can we consider the doubling growth of Asian market by looking at the considerable demand? So, uh, Mr. Dapi and Leonidas, uh, would you like to answer the question? Uh, I believe this is more related to Mr. Dapi. Yes, I think so. Mr. Dapi, can you hear us? Yes, uh, yet now, yes. Can you repeat, please, the question? Of course. Uh, there is a major share of the global ballast water treatment market in Asia. Can we consider the doubling growth of Asian market by looking at the considerable demand?
yes the uh, the, uh, the answer is a uh, is a uh, for sure yes because of the the demand is uh, is growing uh, is growing very very fast especially in the, in the area mentioned by by the question uh, so there is no doubt that uh, uh, for sure there will be an increase of, of, of demand okay thank you very much and here we have a question directed to Michaela. Hi, uh, does RENA also create view fuel record management reports that integrate with major PMS? So uh, we've not developed the VAT record book yet, but of course we are in the development of all of them, so we will reach that point. Okay. And... Okay, we already answered the question. This one as well. Okay, for how long can the data of electronic logbook be stored and will it be easy to access during the inspections, vetting, port state? Okay, so actually as we are on cloud, we don't have any, any limit. It's actually only a matter of space we can buy. We uh, ensure for flag approvals purposes at least five years of uh, data retention. But of course, again, as previously said, there is really no limit. Uh, the information can be easily shared with during port state controls, uh, for example, producing on board the ship from the application a PDF copy of the record book. Mm -hmm. And the uh, port state can also easily check the single operations that have been recorded in the format that is actually shown by the tool and not only on the PDF form. The same thing can be done from the shore side. So connecting to the cloud from a, from a simple web link, it's possible to reach a copy of the logbooks and of information recorded. All right, thank you very much. Again, addressing to Michaela, is there any cloud system to store my data and does your company have access to it when stored? As a cloud, at the moment we are using Microsoft Azure. Uh, the installation can be using our cloud or on premises of a company, so using the company cloud. Uh, Rina, uh, does not access the data. We do it only for maintenance purposes, of course, because again, all the data recorded has legal validity. So we don't want to mess up and uh, to, to create problems uh, with the data. So the responsibility is fully of the company, both on the reporting and on the maintenance, let's say of the, of the um, information. We don't uh, check them. All right. And? Uh, okay, if the data is cloud-based, is there a risk for areas of low and poor quality access to the cloud? For example, stable um, internet connection is a problem on board in various okay. locations? No, no, this is not a problem because the ships are self-consistent. So they can act in an offline mode if they don't have connectivity, they can report, continue the reporting while they are offline. And whenever they have again the connectivity, the information stream will start again and the data will flow to the cloud and then on shore. So we also have an installation on board that keeps the information, of course. All right. Thank you very much. And OK, here we have a question. I believe it's to Mr. Dapi. This disparity between uh, USCG and the IMO testing methods, the system have two different operating modes that the operator must choose between before starting a ballast operation, US and IMO. Uh, what kind of solution could be offered for this issue? Uh, so as as mentioned in, in into the into the to the questions uh, uh, all systems are fitted with uh, with two kind of operation mode united states coast guard and uh, and uh, imo mode and uh, uh, the, the ship staff can select the, the mode uh, 
according to the trade of the vessel. Of course, operating in the United States costs GAB more, mode is more demanding uh, uh, in terms of UV intensity to be those to reach the standard prescribed by the, the United States. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Leonidas? Yes? Uh, do you have any um, idea about the question or would you like me to repeat the question once again? Can you please, yes. Can you please of course. Repeat? Uh, this disparity between USCG and the IMO testing methods. Uh, these systems have two different operating modes that the operator must choose between before starting a ballast operation, US and IMO. What kind of solution could be offered for this issue? Okay, yes, I do understand uh, that there is uh, this dual mode between uh, the two regulations. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there is a, some kind of uh, harmonization of the guidelines which are going to be considered for the next, uh, for with the US VIDA. So many of these areas are expected to be harmonized. Uh, however, I do consider, uh, I, I, I still see that some of the differences in the, in the testing uh, methods are going to still, uh, are going to be uh, still valid in the forthcoming uh, years. All right, thank you very much. And the question to Ms. Uh, Michaela, do you offer any integration for your logbook system uh, from bridge equipment? Okay, so at the, not sure if the question is related to the DAC logbook or in general to the logbooks. Anyway, at the moment, we are not interfacing uh, any equipment because uh, uh, it could be an additional problem with flag uh, approval, but uh, we have the technology to do it, and in the next step, we will interface different sensors on board and equipment on board. All right, thank you very much. Here we have another question. Anisha areas are acting as hotspots for aquatic um, invasive species. However, they are more difficult to clean. Since the cleaning of the niche areas won't give the same benefit as whole cleaning, what will be the ship? What will be uh, the ship owner's incentive to clean the niche areas as well? I believe this is for me. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. Uh, here is not uh, this is not such a, such, such true because uh, biofouling in many niche areas uh, might cause uh, problems in internal uh, system vessels with no kind of internal piping. So this might lead to other problems uh, regarding safety, safety operation of the vessel. So it's equally important to have these areas uh, uh, clean. Uh, but bear also in mind that uh, niche areas are also high-risk areas for many biofouling regulations. Uh, for example, in California, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, investors have a prolonged stay and uh, needs areas uh, are definitely need to be cleaned prior to arrival again in a California port. So, and also through the ballast water management plan, needs areas are also considered as high risk areas uh, due to this fact uh, exactly that it's very difficult to be cleaned and uh, they, they concentrate a uh, higher uh, biofouling uh, concentration. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davi, do you have any idea for this question? Would you like me to repeat it once again? Yes, please. Of course. Niche areas are acting as hotspots for aquatic um, invasive species. However, they are more difficult to clean. Since the cleaning of the niche areas won't give the same benefit as hull cleaning, what will be the ship, ship owner's incentive to clean the niche areas as well? Yes, this is a, this is a, a good question. And however, the, 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 the niche area, the hot spot of the, of the vessel, and uh, today we assisted in uh, uh, several popping up of regulation which can penalize the vessel. For instance, also in, the, in New Zealand, 
there is a new requirement which prescribes to clean the niche area according the lifetime of the anti-falling applied to the vessel, which must be done if the vessel is in the half period of lifetime every six months. And, and then we need to be more strict in terms of verification. So I do believe that the niche area is a, is a, a, a practical approach. Uh, and uh, so if the niche area are okay, most probably also the, the remain part of the hull will be okay. So I mean, without anti -folding. Because for any, for uh, uh, several kinds of reason, the niche area are, uh, are subject more often to the for the formation of, of anti-falling. For instance, just to give an example, okay, a niche area is the area below the block when the vessel is on on the on the on, in the shipyard. So the, below the block, we cannot paint, we cannot apply fresh anti-falling. So this become a niche area, and so if the niche area is okay for sure, the remain part of the of the of the hull will be free of uh, anti falling So I do believe that niche area approach is, a, is a, 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 a good approach and is approach by priority. All right, thank you very much for the answer. And um, are all RENA ELB on board users sharing common um, public private key set, Michaela? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm like sorry, I don't have an answer for this because it's a more IT-related question. question. Uh, okay. For sure, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm from the marine side. Uh, for sure, we have an anti-tampering uh, module working, which ensures the integrity of the data. All right. So we have a question here. I think we haven't answered it yet. If I'm, please correct me if I'm wrong. If you connect to uh, Ethereum blockchain, there would be no possibility to change any data once entered. If there is a need to add a data um, on a submitted log, does Rena automatically generate compliance report or there is an option to fill it manually on Rena platform? Uh, again, I'm sorry, this is a really specific, uh, specific IT, IT question. If needed, IT I can... Question have more information and answer later on. All right, well noted. Okay, here we, let me just check if we left any question answered because some of the questions um, were answered in a written form by our speakers. I just ask you a second to check once again. All right. Okay, I believe we answered all the questions. Yes, I see. Just making sure that if there is no one left unanswered, unattended. And yes. Yeah, we have we have answered um, all the questions, and as, as mentioned, most of the questions were answered in a written form. Okay, unfortunately, Mr. Woodall, Paul Woodall, was not able to join us today due to some technical issues. Uh, and but um, we are very thankful uh, for the speakers for their time for joining us today for this interesting uh presentations and uh, the discussion and thank you very much for all the attendees for joining us for being very interactive with their questions and i would love to hear some final notes from the speakers if they wish and then we can come to the end mr Davi. Oh, it was from from my side it was a very interesting section uh, it was very uh, proactive we shared a lot of uh, experience in on different topics and so it was uh, again very very interesting thank you very much for joining us Leonidas 
Yes, I also agree. It was very broad and uh, diverse uh, topics. Uh, it's, uh, when we combined and see all this, we see a general overview of uh, the industry and where it is going. And uh, I hope that everybody enjoyed it and uh, take care of everybody with this uh, COVID situation. I hope all the best. Thank you very much. And lastly, Michaela. Yeah. Um, yeah, as well, it's very happy to have done this presentation and it was very interesting to see how the participants were interested in the topics and how many questions they, they've done. So it's a really uh, glimpse of how the market is, is working and how these topics are important now. Okay, great then. Thank you very much again. Uh, for all and as a final note uh, tomorrow we will have the second module of the conference which will be performance uh, monitoring module and we are uh, looking forward to meeting you all uh, tomorrow for the second um, module for the second session of the conference and for today that's all from our side and again thank you and wish you a great day to all bye-bye